Welcome. Thank you very much for attending. Um, what we're going to go through in probably around the next 45 to 50 minutes then is a number of stories, or actually four stories in particular, of some Bedford College and Royal Holloway College graduates. One of which as well, one of these people we're going to be talking about is actually attended both colleges. So there's a nice kind of uh, segue between the two or link between there that we'll be exploring as part of that individual story. Now with the people that we are going to be looking at, um, what I'm kind of going to do is for each one is a little bit of three parts is in talk a little bit around their life pre coming to Bedford or Royal Holloway, their life a bit at uh, the respective college based on what we can learn from their student record and also what they did then go on to achieve in their later lives. And with the achievements, with a number of them where you may have heard of some of the people we're going to talk about before or may not, there's some very noteworthy and impressive achievements within their lives that we will mention. But what I'm actually going to try and do with a number of these people is maybe highlight some things that aren't as well known or aren't as a kind of um, a perhaps seen as a big achievement as other things that which might be an unfair kind of description, but things that you might not be aware of that they actually did and achieved alongside what have been their most noteworthy achievements. And and through this, I want to kind of pull a few little strands or threads or themes through this and try, try and knit a few things together of, even though with some of these people, while they did have particular relationships between themselves in a couple of instances, but certain things that they did within their lives that would have impacted or intersected with their others, even if they didn't actually meet. So the first person that I actually want to talk about then is Rich Mel Crompton who you may or may not be aware of, was the author of the Just William series of books. Now, Rich Mel Crompton was born 15th of November in 1890, all the way up in Lancashire in Bury, so just outside Manchester. And she was the daughter of the Reverend Edward John Sowell Lamburn, who was a classics master at Bury Grammar School, and Clara Crompton. Now, there's something interesting in terms of... Um, her later life and some of the things that she trained to do in terms of her father's um, profession in that that's something that she actually thought about pursuing as well. Now one of the things we can say about her upbringing is that she she wasn't from a poor background but she certainly wasn't from a rich background either. In terms of her education she attended a boarding school which was set up for orphans and also daughters specifically of the clergy and this was something that she was able to attend in a subsidized manner so there wasn't too much of a financial imposition to her family because at the time education was only compulsory between the ages of five and ten but what we do know and this is actually shown on her student record as well that she was in education all the way up to the age of over 20 when she did then join Royal Holloway. So this is kind of reflective then as of a couple of things and the thread that I perhaps want to pull through with her story is that she had a certain determination and an opportunity to follow education because of her intelligence, because of what she wanted to achieve in her life and was able to do that through her respective achievements and the education she got at Royal Holloway. Now one of the things about Richard Malcompton is very early on it's kind of known that she wanted to be a school teacher. She wanted to follow in her father's footsteps. And this is interesting, isn't it? At the time, um, her father was afforded certain rights as a school teacher, which would have been denied Rich Mel Crompton. That at the time, if you were a woman and wanted to become a school teacher, that essentially meant that you couldn't get married. It wasn't until 1919 with the Sex Disqualification Removal Act that in law, you could become a school teacher and also be married, even though there's quite a lot of evidence that it wasn't really rigorously enforced and there were still instances where women were pressured to resign if they did become married when they were teaching at school. So there's an interesting kind of little thing here of her father in the profession that he did and her following in her footsteps. He was afforded certain rights that were denied her through that life choice. And I'd like, I'd invite people to kind of keep that in the back of their mind at the moment, as in there's something at the end of the talk, I want to try and bring that a little bit full circle in terms of one of the other people's stories that I'd talk about. Now, from all of this in her education that she went through, in 1911, she ends up signing up to Royal Holloway to study classics. So she's following 
in terms of again her father's footsteps who's a classics teacher she signs up at royal holloway to study classics and this is her student record here a copy of it here that we can look at and there's a few things that we can actually draw out of it and learn about her life at this time and certain bits and pieces she joins the college at very specifically according to record at the age of 22 and 11 not 22 sorry 20 and 11 months old like very precise with the age there which is actually a little bit older than what perhaps the vast majority of students would have been at the time at the time intake began at the age of 17 and so typically quite a number of the students would have been around that age or late teenagers and so she would have perhaps been perceived as a mature student at the time now looking at actually at the section which says particulars of previous education while we can't quite discern fully all of the handwriting there of the exact places of some of them but we can see from the dates that all the way up to 1911 she was still in some form of education and the last qualification that she did achieve was the um, university's matriculation which was the examination to be accepted to university which she did before being accepted at royal holloway on a scholarship because one of the things that i was kind of drawing out that she wasn't from a poor background but she wasn't from a family of means that actually she was able to attend by getting a scholarship to study for three years whilst at Royal Holloway and the scholarship came in the form of £60 a year which would be around £7,880 according to a conversion calculator I found on the internet in today's money what's not clear with the scholarship is whether that was just to cover fees and accommodation or was also for living expenses as well so we don't quite know what kind of um, financial burden was placed on herself or her family but 60 pounds at the time and that amount of money was a significant sum that from her that she had earned from her own intellect her own education her own determination to get to this point in her education and i think a kind of theme here in terms of her life up to this point is that she had a clear kind of determination on what she wanted to do what she wanted to study and achieve and through doing the matriculation exam getting into royal holloway getting the scholarship kind of shows then a determination to achieve this and this determination is kind of shown later life as well with a number of other things that she did do now one of the other things we do that i know about that's not actually in the student record here was that she was quite involved in some of the sports societies at the college and also as well that while she wasn't actively involved in the women's suffrage movement we know that she was supportive of it and it was something that she did speak and have some involvement with when she was at royal holloway one of the things that i've actually included here is a, a photo of the original founders library here which would have been when she attended uh, just i think 30 around 35 36 years old but I include this as in we still have the founders library as the founders reading room and you'll actually if you ever do have seen it or get the chance to visit notice that the book shelving the shelving's very much the same and I believe it's the same it's been preserved and restored but I just kind of like the idea that at some point Rich Malcrompton may have been sitting in this library studying coming up perhaps with some of the early ideas for just William who knows I'm perhaps speculating beyond the evidence here at this point but this is a room that you can still go and sit in today you can then have that almost like shared experience of this is a place where Rich Malcrom Rich Malcrompton was that you can still go to today now once she did graduate successfully with her uh, degree in classics she returned to her old boarding school that she attended as a classics mistress before then moving to Bromley in southeast London again initially teaching but then what happened at that point in her life is that she began to really write in earnest and this is where actually she starts moving away actually from the teaching profession which was something she'd always worked for and endeavored towards and moving into a new profession now one of the things as well that we, we can kind of say at this point is that there was a number of health factors that did start to impact and influence her life and perhaps how she did want to go about it um, at the age of 33 she lost the use of her right leg due to polio and this along with actually the growing success of her writing career was what probably led to her retiring from the teaching profession um, a couple of years later in her mid-30s 
at this point as well in her mid 30s this is where her writing and the just william books really actually do become very popular at the time she's an author in the sense where there hasn't been the popularity after anything she very much enjoyed success in her own time and it was i believe three years after retiring from teaching she'd earned enough money to buy herself a small manor house that she bought and her mother moved into as well unfortunately in her 40s as well she did then suffer from breast cancer and had a mastectomy but there's something within this story as well and this kind of like a disadvantage or problems that she'd had from this that she still maintained a degree of determination to achieve what she wanted to do during the second world war she actually volunteered for the fire service despite the problems with her leg from polio and the kind of health effects that have come from the mastectomy she wanted to be a part she wanted to contribute she had this determination to if i use the phrase do her part do her bit and one of the other things as well that with this little backdrop around her health but her financial success from writing is actually how prodigious she was with her writing she wrote 39 just william stories and 53 other books or publications the fact that her writing career spanned approximately 40 years meant that she was writing at around two and a half books each year so there's this real kind of prodigious rate that's the amount of writing that she is able to do and is putting out there really is quite phenomenal in its own right it's, it's a huge amount and very impressive and again it's kind of testament to a determination to be successful to achieve and to be putting these stories out there now one of the things around this is in terms of there's a number of things i mentioned i've got nothing to do with just william the books what she's actually most famous for and with the books themselves there's a whole kind of debate actually where the inspiration for them came from some people argue it's from her younger brother jack or from one of her nephews at the time that was the inspiration for it and for me it's not to speculate on who it may or may not have been i think what we can say though for any of you who have read the just william books is that it kind of casts a wry lens on society or certain things through a, a kind of i don't say innocent child's eyes because i think you can argue william is anything but innocent in some instances but that mischievous child's eyes on particular kind of societal or parental or adult behaviors or actions that uh, and putting like a humorous whimsical slant on it at times but that's not to say that um with the writing that it's, it's any kind of like a rose tinted lens of kind of village life or child's life or anything like that quite a lot of her later books are really actually quite reflective of the times that she was writing and in showing again her kind of idea of people doing their part or of contributing in some way during the second world war she was publishing books like william and the air raid precautions william and the evacuees william does his bit and william carries on and so i think within a number of the titles you can show it's very much reflective of the times it wasn't a story or anything that just sat in a time period and in situ she developed it she evolved it she made it relevant and that's probably part of the reason for their very big success after the war as well she went and was writing books like william and the moon rocket william and the space animal william's television show and again is, is kind of reflective she followed and changed with the times and this is probably why i think in total she sold upwards of 12 million copies by the end of her life in 1969 so she did die at the age of 78 and i think kind of the, the narrative or story through this is that she comes from a relatively humble means but through her own endeavor her own determination she gets to a point with her education where she's earned the rights to this scholarship then at royal holloway to study this degree in classics that she can then go into the teaching profession that she wanted to and to follow that career path the kind of dual um, elements of the un being unwell but then also the actual growing success of her writing leads to this career change and that's then where i think her legacy comes in that despite the health problems that she did experience she still writes and publishes a huge amount of books she's still contributing during the second world war she's volunteering for the fire service and in this sense the kind of thread here isn't isn't that she's just an author there's a lot more to her story there's a lot more that she's achieved 
And I think some of that is born through what she was able to do through her education and through Royal Holloway. So that's Rich Mel Crompton. That's kind of snapshot in her life. And the one thing that I want you to bear in the back of mind was the comment I made earlier around um, the law in respect to uh, married women being teachers. Because there's something I'm going to kind of bring that round full circle at the end with one of the other people I want to speak about. The next person that I'm going to speak about is Kathleen Yardley. And Kathleen Yardley, she's a Bedford College uh, alumni and who joined the college in 1919 studying mathematics. And people may or may not be aware of her already. But in terms of her early life, she was born January 1903 in Newbridge in Ireland. So it was then at a very, very young age, she did actually move across to Essex when she was five years old. And I think... Interestingly, in this, she was actually the tenth child of well Harry Yardley, the town postmaster, and Jimmy, uh, Jesse Cameron. And a th not to say like being a tenth child has any bearing on this, but there's a number of things that actually happened through her education and what she then achieves through this young move in life, through the education she gets of how much she achieves off her own back, her own intelligence from this. Again, this is another person who's not come from wealthy means. She's not come from a family who have. £60 a year disposable income to be sending her to a college and certainly with 10 children that's not going to be the case on a postmaster's salary. Now initially she attended Woodford County High School for girls but then actually she transferred to Ilford County High School for boys and there's a little kind of interesting reason for this that is slightly reflective of the t attitudes at the times but also actually a very much a compliment to her own intelligence and skill within particular subjects because the subjects that she wanted to study were mathematics and science and these were not taught at the girls school and in some instances there was still this kind of attitude around women's education in some particular subjects that weren't feminine subjects however she had shown such an aptitude such um being very good at them that she was then accepted to the boys school to study maths and science. So I'm not going to say this is entirely unprecedented, but it's certainly a remarkable kind of event in her life and really does show and pay testament to how intelligent she actually was, how talented she was in these subjects. Now, she does then apply to study at Bedford College in 1919. So if you do a very bit of quick maths that she was born in 1903 and she's applying for Bedford College in 1919, she's applying when she's 16 years old. So this is a year ahead of what the usual age of intake would be. Now we've got here, and these are from the archive records, her actual student application. There's again, a number of quite interesting little stories that you can pull out of this that again, are really paying testament to her particular talent in these subjects, her determination to receive this education, to do well in it, and what the opportunity then that Bedford College does allow her. So we know, first of all, that she applies at the age of 16, a year younger than you would normally apply. So that, first of all, demonstrates quite how intelligent she was. The other thing we know from this is as well that she was an awarded, she was awarded again a £60 scholarship a year to be doing the studies. So again, it's showing that she's again come from relatively humble background, but she's showing through her own determination, her own intelligence, her own achievements, that she's worthy of this scholarship. She's getting this money so she can come and study. Now, the little letter that's on the right hand side here is written from the college back to the school that she was attending, which essentially says in summary that based on an interview that she had, so what Kathleen had with the principal, who the principal at the time, I believe, let me get this right, would have been Margaret Tuke, I believe, and also um, an interview as well, it would have been with, uh, let me check the letter, uh, Professor Hilton. She was then accepted to study alongside the recommendation from her previous education and nothing further. So in this sense, it doesn't seem that she's actually had to take the uh, matriculation exam or anything like that from what we can tell from the records or from education history she's accepted in based on the interview and her current education achievement and the recommendation from her current school so again this is all playing testament to the fact of just how evidently talented and exceptional she was within science and within maths 
Now, this is a photo of the Regent's Park campus, which would have been the Bedford College campus she would have attended at the time, I believe. It had moved away from York Place, I think around 1913 it was. This gives you an idea of the campus that she was coming on to as a 16-year-old at that point, which she would have been 17, obviously, early in the next year. But this just gives you an idea, perhaps, again, of this world that she's now moving into, that she's come from humble beginnings in Ireland, moving to Essex at a young age and going through this educational process. That she's stepping into this kind of new world now. Now, one of the things then in terms of her story going through Bedford College and then later on is that quite a number of notable achievements and really, really successful career around physics. Now, she graduated with her BSc in Mathematics in 1922. She then immediately went to University College London to do her MSc in Physics and graduated two years later. From that, she immediately joined, and this is where there's a few scientific terms, so please forgive me if I get the pronunciation wrong, but the Crystallography Research Team headed by William Henry Bragg at the Royal Institute. And she really then goes straight into this academic research career. At this point in when she does join the Royal Institute as well, she writes a letter to Margaret Tuke, the uh, principal at Bedford College. Initially, it seems like to tell her of her new appointment where she'll be doing some teaching at King's College as part of this, as part of Univer London University. What she actually goes on to do, which I find quite interesting within the letter, is ending up doing a kind of... Um, point by point critique of all of the different physics labs at a number of different colleges around London. So she talks about the Bedford College one, she talks about the King's College one, uh, the one at the um, London Institute as well, and comparing them all as to their different advantages and whether they were any good or not. Bedford gets a fair kind of um, analysis, I think, with saying they weren't too bad, but there was some room for improvement. But I think it's quite interesting as the letters revealing in terms of what starts off as in a Oh, I'm writing you to let you know about my success, but very quickly kind of goes into this um, very kind of formal and almost work professional analysis of particular labs, particular things that are influencing or affecting the work that she can do. It's maybe a bit revealing of her mindset and an attitude to how she has approached her career and her education. Now, she does leave the institute and the research around 1929 to start a family at that point, and so. She probably comes through marriage Kathleen Lonsdale, which you may uh, know her better under that name as well. And during even when she was being um, a mother, she was still continuing and following her research on her own personal terms, where she was calculating structure factors, which I hope no one's going to ask me exactly what that means. But through this, when she does return to the Royal Institute in 1934, she does go on to discover the structure of benzene, and hexachloride benzene as well. Now, one of the key things within a work that was a, a very big kind of uh, achievement for her was the pioneering work around the use of x-rays to study crystals. And as well, she does also get a DSC from University College London in 36 while she was working at the Royal Institution. And so there's this constant kind of conveyor belt almost of um, job roles, research, achievements, and qualifications that she's adding as she goes through. In terms of her career around all of her research in physics and materials, it's in 1949 she was appointed Professor of Chemistry and Head of the Department of Crystallography at University College London. In 1945 as well, she became one of the first two women elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society. The other was the biochemist uh, Marjorie Stevenson. Now, as I've said, one of the threads I want to kind of pull is that those are a kind of big, notable achievement that she's perhaps well, most well known for. But there's a lot of other elements to her that I want to talk about and highlight as well. One of the things about her that's perhaps not as well known is that she was actually a Quaker and a committed pacifist. And while she was quite widely published on a lot of scientific subjects, she actually had a number of publications around pacifism, um, and her thoughts around that as well. Um, she has a book, Quakers Visit Russia, which was an account of when she went over to Russia in the early 1950s with a group of Quakers um, to try and kind of build relations as part of her friend's peace committee. 
1953, she wrote a book, Removing the Causes of War. And in 1957, Is Peace Possible? And so there's this kind of element to her life where she's actually got this whole other aspect to it. She's not just a scientist, if that's even a fair statement to make. It's that there's more to her, that there's this whole other dynamic to her of this world that she's exploring and promoting and advocating for. The consequence of this actually as being a pacifist led to her being imprisoned for a month in Holloway Prison during the Second World War. So the Bedford College student ends up in Holloway Prison. We had kind of a comparison there to make in some, some senses. But this was because she refused to register for civil defence duties and then consequently wouldn't pay the fine for refusing to register. Now this kind of event and her kind of opinions around this uh, informed a number of other things that she went to in her life as well. Her experiences in the month in prison led to her becoming a prison reform activist and she joined the Howard League for Penal Reform and that was something that she campaigned for and spoke out about. She did die on the 1st of April 1971 at 68 and there's a whole kind of long list of achievements that she had in her life, awards that she was given and the legacy that she has kind of left behind in that respect. She was elected an honorary member of the uh, Women's Engineers Society. She was a Dame Commander of the Order of the, Order of the British Empire. She was elected as the first woman president of the International Union of Crystallography. She was elected as the first woman president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And she actually has um, what is it, a, a rare form of diamond only found in meteorites named after her called Lonsdalite. And I think there's perhaps something kind of fitting in this that she's got a very rare diamond named after her because I think with her life, her achievements and everything that she was this rare diamond. She did have these achievements. She's shown from the age of 16 to be going in and getting the scholarship at Bedford College, just how intelligent and determined she was and the contribution she did make to her field. And so again, there's this thread of yes, her education afforded her certain things, and you can see from her career track and achievements how that all links through. But there's so much more to her as well as a Quaker, as a pacifist, as a campaigner for prison reform. The next person that I want to speak about then with our alumni stories is Louisa Martindale. And Louisa Martindale, she's a Royal Holloway graduate who joined in 1890 and kind of then wanted into a quite remarkable life around medicine and as a surgeon. Now, Louisa Martindale, she's born in October 1872 in Leiston, London. Her parents were Martin and Louisa Martindale. And one thing to note here that perhaps keeps in the back of your mind was she was the older sister of Hilda Martindale, who's someone that I do actually want to speak about a bit in a moment as well. So keep that in the back of your mind that there's actually a sister in this story as well. Now, Louisa's mother of the same name was an active suffragist. Her mother was a member of the Women's Liberation Federation and was on the executive committee of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. We know as well that um, her mother used to hold events at the family home where she'd have um, shop girls coming by or women in the local community to have talks, get support, discussions. And I think you can kind of see from these events how they do inform some of Louise's life, how they do kind of impact on the career path to some extent she goes through, but certainly some of the things that she was campaigning for and attitudes that she held. Now, her father actually died quite young. And so as a family, her mother and sister, they traveled around Europe, mainly to Germany and Switzerland, where they did start some of their formal education under some tutelage there, which does actually kind of show them that these were a family of means. Her father, I believe, had been a, a London trader or um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not trader, but I'll, it'll come to me in a moment and I'll randomly say in a sentence, but they were a family of means. They did have money at their disposal. And one of the things they did do when they were younger was traveling around Europe, having governesses, doing their education at a young age. But they did then return to England as well, to Brighton, where her and her sister attended the Brighton High School for Girls. Now, her family, well, her mother in particular, was very keen and very encouraging for her to follow and pursue education and to use that as a means of, again, a bit of social mobility, but to have a career. And from very early on, 
Louisa decided that she did want to be a doctor. Now, at the age of 17, she went to Royal Holloway, and that was to complete the London matriculation, which is an interesting one, as in for like Richmond Compton and Kathleen um, Dudley as well, who'd had to do that qualification beforehand to earn the uh, scholarship. Louisa Martindale, who'd come from some means who could pay to attend immediately, was able to conduct and complete that qualification while she was there. And so we can see from her student record here, again, the information around this, and there's some very interesting little stories and tidbits that we can pull out from what is recorded here. One of the things that you might be drawing your attention to is there actually is, under the course of study column in the page on the right hand side here, something added in in red pen as well, something that's been added in from when the original record was put in. Now, what that actually says, so we've got all of when she signed up, the parent's guardian, the parent's occupation is listed as widow, interestingly enough, despite we know her involvement in certain groups and things, and that she had private tuition in the Brighton High School of Girls. But why it actually says under course of study, which the course of study was the London Preliminary Scientific, was that underneath it, it says not fully completed whilst at Royal Holloway. And that's quite an interesting sentence because as a kind of a superficial reading, I might think, well, well, hold on, what's gone wrong here? It's not been fully completed. Did she not complete her studies? Was she not clever enough? Was she kicked out Do some scandalous things? Or what actually has happened here? But this is actually where you look at the honours gained and it actually tells you the story of what's happened here. And we know then from other records and other research how this actually is showing. It's indicating a first really positive step on her career to becoming a doctor. What she did do actually is that when she completed the London matriculation at Royal Holloway, she actually then immediately applied to study at the, um, let me get the institute correct, sorry, at the, um, oh, I've lost it in my notes, I do a part, to the, uh, sorry, the London School of Medicine for Women. So she doesn't actually complete the, um, a preliminary scientific course while at Royal Holloway, what she ends up doing is changing schools after passing the matriculation, going to the London School of Medicine for Women, where she then completes the preliminary scientific. And what she then also then goes on to do is complete further studies and gaining her MB in medicine. And that was done in 1899. So what you can actually see here is Royal Holloway is actually a, almost a stepping stone for her that she was able Yes, she was rightly there based on her own intelligence, but she was able to pay to attend, to pass this particular exam, to then get into another additional school to pursue the career that she wanted. And so this note on a cursory reading might indicate that she hadn't been like fully accomplished or hadn't achieved at Royal Hollow, but actually that's very far from the truth. She had achieved what she wanted to and needed to, and then used that as a next step to go on in her career. Now, from this then, she completes her degree and she goes on to become a general practitioner working in Hull for a number of years before then returning to Brighton. She's completed her studies to become a doctor. She's done general practice in Hull for a number of years before then returning to Brighton again. And while in Brighton in 1920, she was instrumental in setting up the new Sussex Hospital for Women um, in Brighton. Now, when she was there, she held the post of senior surgeon and physician until she moved to London in the later 1930s to work as a private consultant. Now, her whole speciality was around um, gynecology, obstetrics, and so her research actually focused a lot on venereal disease and prostitution and kind of sexual health around that. Now, there's something kind of interesting in this and there's perhaps some links you can draw back to her experiences growing up as a mother involved in the suffrage movement for women's equal rights. And within that, there would have been like access to health care and women's issues involved in that. And this is perhaps a little strand or thread that you can pull through to how this influences her career and what she does get involved in. Now, her particular research at the time was considered very controversial. It was quite a taboo subject that people weren't researching or if they were, they weren't kind of publishing and putting it out there and really kind of shouting from the rooftops about it. But Louisa really kind of, Martin, she really kind of 
uh, breaks from that mold she does put it out there she is publishing books now and in 1909 she publishes the book under the surface which talks about these topics and her research into them and this causes quite a bit of consternation at the time it's reported that in the house of commons this was actually brought up as something as is, is this proper kind of behavior becoming a woman or research that we should really be doing is this something that is, is it scandalous or progress in medical health I've tried looking actually in Hansard for the records around this, but I've been unable to find it. But what this actually kind of little anecdotal story is demonstrating is the standing that she has achieved, that she is being discussed in these corridors of power, that her reputation and standing in the profession precedes her, that people are taking note of what she's saying. She does cause a rift, she does cause a stir. One of her other notable achievements within healthcare is that she does start doing some pioneering and groundwork research into the treatment of uterine cancer and uh, fibroid growths as well. And so again, like with her, there's a lot of very notable achievements in the medical profession that she does do. But there again, with the other examples we've talked about, there's more to her. There's more to her story that I want to kind of shine a bit of a spotlight on. During the First World War, she served as a surgeon over in France. So actually, she went over to France. She wasn't on the front line, so far as we know, but was working in hospitals as a surgeon, helping the wounded. In the Second World War, she was in London, again, working, volunteering as a surgeon for the war efforts, so helping with the wounded and supporting that. One of the things as well is that she continues her mother's legacy of campaigning for women's suffrage. Excuse me. She was an active member of the Brighton's Women's Franchise Association and alongside this she served as a magistrate on the Brighton bench, she was president of the Medical Women's Federation and was a prison commissioner as well and a member of the National Council of Women, just to kind of name a few. So alongside her career and profession of being a surgeon, being a general practitioner, she's still very much involved in politics, in campaigning, in pushing for women's rights, women's suffrage equality and she's doing that not just on the kind of local level of the magistrate on the Brighton bench but on the medical women's federation as well she's pushing it as a career for the national council of women and there's a neat, nice little link here as well that she was a prison commissioner so in terms of thinking back to kathleen yardley and her whole experience as a pacifist and going and serving time in prison as well that there's a little kind of little link here a little tenuous link now that we've got here where we've got excuse me, Louisa Martindale serving as a prison commissioner. Now she dies at the age of 93 in February 1966 and by this time, at the point of her death, she's performed over 7,000 surgeries. She's published eight books on medicine including an autobiography, A Woman Surgeon and really her legacy as we can talk about it is that she broke down or started to break down many of the taboos or controversies around women's health, around venereal disease and the treatment of it. Um, researcher Wendy Moore in 2018 wrote a journal article that was titled The Medical Suffragettes, of which there was a focus on Louisa Martin. And I think that kind of that title, The Medical Suffragettes, really does capture this, this dual element to her life and her achievements. The kind of segue that I want to take from Louisa is actually to her sister, Hilda Martindale. And there's a couple of reasons that I want to make this kind of like segue now into Hilda Martindale that I just want to cover very quickly. And one of the reasons for this is actually Hilda Martindale, I'm aware, is the former Royal Holloway archivist, Annabel Valentine's kind of favourite alumni that um, she likes to talk about and promote in her work. The other kind of element into this is that there's still quite a bit of research to be done into her life and her very notable achievements. She kind of seems to exist a little bit in the shadow of her sister and especially if you conduct any research online, very much Louisa Martindale's at the forefront rather than Hilda. And so the reason then that I want to include her and talk about is to actually bring it to the forefront, start talking about some of her achievements and really actually showing how noteworthy and the impact she did have in a number of areas. 
The curious thing as well that um, for Hilda Martindale, she actually attended both Royal Holloway and Bedford College. So she kind of straddles both colleges in that respect as in she's attended both. She's got qualifications from both. And so really has that nice link between the two colleges as well that kind of pulls this story together. Now, as I've said, she's the sister of Louisa Martindale. And so in that sense, her whole kind of young experience as a child is very much the same. She attended the Brighton High School for Girls after traveling around Europe, was obviously born in Laystone as well. And also as well was, was there that her father had passed away young. So they got a little bit of that same formative experience that they've gone through. And this whole kind of idea that's perhaps come from the mother around equal rights for women, women's suffrage and the campaigns around that. While we can see that coming through with Louisa with the work that she did, particularly in medicine and her own campaigns, but we can draw the similar threads through for Hilda and the profession that she went into as well. Unfortunately, one of the reasons why I do want to kind of mention her, but is a bit of a gap at the moment with the research is because of the current situation and unfortunately not having an archivist in post, I've been unable to access her particular student record. So at this point, I can't tell you the exact dates that she attended the respective colleges and what qualifications that she actually did. What we've kind of got from the information that is available is able to kind of pick up her story afterwards and maybe kind of draw some inferences of what she was able to achieve there having attended both colleges and the career then that she then did follow. So pretty much straight we think after coming out of uh, education in 1901 she joined the civil service in the role as a government factory inspector. So from this she's going into the civil service, she's going into government job and what is very much at this time a male dominated profession. It's not to say she was pioneering in this respect, but we've got to put this into context that the first sitting female MP wasn't until 1919 and the first female cabinet member wasn't until 1929. So she's going into a world where in terms of actual enfranchisement hasn't happened yet. There also hasn't been female representation within government or parliament at this point, but she's going into as a factory inspector, again, a male dominated profession as a woman straight out of education. So I think there's something quite noteworthy and remarkable about that achievement and, and her mindset and determination to do it. One of the things we know then is going through a job role that by 1914, she had become a senior lady inspector. So she's been promoted up and given perhaps on the reading of it an unusual name as given the distinction of a senior lady inspector. But she's again, she's showing her talent, she's showing her quality in this job role that she's getting the recognition and the promotion for it. What we believe is that if she wasn't the first, she was certainly one of the very first female factory inspectors in the UK government. And one of the things as well is that 1914 into the wider context of this, you've obviously got the First World War and all of the kind of social upheaval, the social changes, the mobility of women into a lot of manual labouring jobs that they previously weren't doing, that she is the factory inspector of now. So you've got women moving into the workforce, moving into munitions, factories, manufacturing, and she's been there then for kind of 13, 14 years previously inspecting these. And I'm not saying kind of uh, pioneering and laying the groundwork for that to go in because there's so many other factors around the social upheaval then that led to it. But she's part of now this process of women coming into the workforce. And if we're thinking back now and linking to the previous comment around Rishmael Compton about going into teaching with the Sex Disqualification Removal Act in 1919, we've got to think as well then at this point of the wider context of still this attitude that within law, there are certain jobs women can't do if they're married. So there's again this wider context that she is now this government factory inspector is feeding into and doing. Now, we know that she was extremely well respected and very good at the job because in 1918 she was awarded an OBE for her work for the government. We also know as well that she went as a government advisor and representative to four international labour conferences as well. And we know from the Hansard records that she was only one of two women on the delegation of over 30 people that were sent 
the other being uh, Miss Julia Varley, who was the Transport and General Workers Union representative. So again, this is showing that she's really in this male dominated world, but she's holding her own. She is showing her quality, she's showing her substance, she was showing her determination, and she's excelling and achieving within it. Now there is, as I've said, with all of these people's stories that I've been talking about so far, there's this dual element to it, that it's not just the career that defines it, there's so much more around it as well. She was involved in the women's suffrage movement and she attended events with her mother, including the 1904 International Congress of Women in Berlin. She was a member of the Whitley Council uh, Committee on the Women's Question, and as such, she, she argued and campaigned for several things that first of all, and this is where I think there's an interesting kind of thing that comes full circle, is that women should not lose their jobs if they do choose to get married. And so with this whole context and around that 1919, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, we know that Hilda Martindown would have been one of the people campaigning for this, pushing it, promoting that she was speaking on these subjects as part of women's suffrage, as part of women's equal rights. We know as well that she was campaigning and talking in favour of equal pay and equal pay for women. And so it's again, this kind of like, even though she probably wouldn't have met Rish Malcompton, that there's this link now in terms of their lives of what they were doing and what they were trying to achieve of how they intersected or would have impacted on the opportunities that then each would have potentially been afforded that they perhaps might not have been otherwise. Now there's a lot more to Hilda's story that is still yet to be uncovered. It's one of the reasons that I did want to include her in this talk now in that there's still more around her contributions and work within government. There's still more around her contributions to the women's suffrage movement in that you could make the argument that she was kind of like on the inside of that government mechanism and system and could have influenced perhaps some change there. And there's some little threads we can pull out in terms of what did come into law and we know she was campaigning on. Now, in terms of kind of bringing this all in and intersecting these different stories and kind of wrapping it up in a summary, look, one of the interesting things that we do have within the archives alongside the student records are these student cards. And we can see we've got three up here. So we've got the one for Kathleen Yardley, we've got Rich Mal Crompton's, and we've got Louisa Martindale's here that we've been able to have access to. And these are interesting little cards, isn't it? It shows several things that I think are quite nice in terms of the college and their relationship with their graduates. If we look at Kathleen Yardley's here, so this would have been from Bedford College. We can see how there's so many notes have been added to this and they're almost running out of space at the top in terms of the number of achievements that she's had. We can see all different handwriting, penmanship and everything. We can see that it's um, added in her new surname as well of all different achievements, all different qualifications that she does have. So I think this is a neat little story that you're showing the college was tracking their careers. They were following them. They were going back and making notes of these notable achievements by these people and recording it within the records. With uh, Louisa Martindale, we can see actually someone had miswritten something which has been crossed out. So we've got MD, it looks like it might have been MB originally put, but again, a number of notes added, a number of things added on. And for uh, Rich Mel Crompton, we can see actually someone's gone back and written in the dates that she did pass away and we can see as well the note just to the left of it says afterwards author and which I can presume or infer to mean that it's keeping track of what her career did go into and did progress into and so I find these records that are in our archives these little student cards this nice little story this nice little bit where you can pick out that different people at different times at the college have been tracking making notes of these people's lives and careers and adding them to these student cards that we've now got in our records. Now, to kind of reflect on all of this in that respect, that what I've shared with you today is kind of like the, a quick life story of four different women who have graduated from Royal Holloway and Bedford College. There's so many more examples out there. And, and like even for the name of the, the building that the library is in, the Emily Wilding Davison building, there's a whole story unexplored in terms of the talks I've done so far around the college's roles within the women's suffrage movement as well. That, we have touched upon this, but there's so much scope to be talking about that as the college's roles and the people who did graduate for them, their roles in that movement. So there's a whole interesting aspect of it there. 
I think as well what we can say from especially with Rishmael Comps and Kathy Yardy where they've got the scholarships to attend, how Royal Holloway and Bedford existed as a form of social mobility and as a new opportunity for women and afforded that opportunity, excelled within certain professions and areas that they not necessarily pioneered their way into, but definitely made their own in some respects. There are so many more stories still to be discovered and told, and hopefully what we're able to do is I know we're heading into another lockdown, but have the opportunity to be sharing these online, surfacing these for people and giving people the opportunity to find out these stories and information that they might not have otherwise. And so there are some future talks planned coming up.